Welcome to the screencast for the incredible novella Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde written by Robert Louis Stevenson in 1885. This is an incredible novella that really deals with, uh, with a lot of big questions about life, about what we are, about the human condition and everything like that. This genre is a gothic mystery story um, and the narrator throughout the whole story is anonymous. We never actually find out who's narrating apart from final parts um, of the novella where we have Dr. Lanyon and we have Dr. Jekyll each having a confessional letter at the end. We don't actually find out who the narrator is. It's anonymous. The point of view that we find that, uh, from the novella is that through the eyes of Mr. Utterson. We really see his ideas uh, and we root for him, if you like, as a character. We tend to discover things as he discovers things. Its um, setting, obviously, is the late 19th century, uh, as the time as it was written in 1885. Okay. Story of the door. I just want you to think about the introduction as well. Just look at the introduction to this novella. Just what exactly what a good introduction should have. It's introducing a character. It's giving us a little bit of intrigue about him. It's not exactly telling us exactly what he is like. And also there's lots of good description about him. Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, was a man of a rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile. Cold, scanty and embarrassed in discourse. Backward in sentiment. Long, as lean, long, dusty, dreary, and yet somehow lovable. Not the best kind of description for a, for a main character. A friendly meeting is when the wine was, to his taste, something eminently human beaconed from his eye. Something indeed which never found its way into his talk, but which spoke not only in these silent symbols of the after-dinner face, but more often and loudly in the acts of his life. He was austere with himself, drank gin when he was along to mortify a taste for vintages. And though he enjoyed the theatre, he had not crossed the, door of, the doors of one for twenty years. But he had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering, almost with envy, at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds, and in any extremity inclined to help rather than reprove. I incline to Hain to Cain's heresy, he used to say. Uh, used to say quaintly. I let my brother go to the devil in his own way. In this character it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of downgoing men. And to such as these, so long as they came about his chambers, he never marked a shade of change in his demeanour. Now that's an important idea, that he was the last reputable person uh, and they got good influence in the lives of men who were on the way down, perhaps through corruption or anything, things like that. So we find out straight from the beginning of this man, Utterson, he's a lawyer. We don't know whether to like him or to dislike him, but he seems to be quite a, f a fair man, is what we fear. And he seems to be, as it says here, at, um, the last reputable acquaintance, which means that he always tried to keep his nose clean, so to speak. He always tried to keep within the law and do the right things. But it's interesting that it's men who are on the way down that he tends to act for. No doubt the feat was easy to Mr. Utterson, for he was undemonstrative at the best, and even his friendship seemed to be founded in a similar Catholicity of good nature. It is the mark of a modern man to accept his friendly circle ready-made from the hands of opportunity, and that was a lawyer's way. So it's just saying that his uh, his friends, the people he's friends with, tend to be those of uh, that, that um, he has met through his life, through things that are important to him. We get told his friends were those of his own blood, so his own family, or those whom he had known the longest. His affections, like ivy, were the growth of time. They implied no aptness in the object. Hence, no doubt, the bond that, uh, that united him to Mr Richard Enfield, his distant kinsman, the well-known man about town. So he's related distantly, maybe a second or third cousin, to this uh, gentleman, Mr Richard Enfield, and he's a well-known man about town. It was a nut to crack for many what these two could see in each other or what subject they could find in common. It was reported by those who encountered them in their Sunday walks that they said nothing, 
looked singularly dull and would and would sorry and would hail with obvious relief the appearance of a friend. For all that, the two men put the greatest store by these excursions, counted them the chief jewel of each week, and not only set aside occasions of pleasure, but even resisted calls of business that they might enjoy that they might enjoy them uninterrupted. So it's just basically saying there that people couldn't understand, people couldn't work out why these two men seemed to be so friendly and what it was they had in common. But to these two men, the narrator tells us, because it's third person, the narrator tells us that it was really important to them both. They both really looked forward to it and they wanted to, 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 to see each other and to be in each other's company. Goes on to tell us, it chanced in one of those rambles that their way led them down a by street in a busy quarter of London. The street was small and what is called quiet, but it drove a thriving trade on the weekdays. The inhabitants were all doing well, it seemed, and all emulously hoping to do better still, and laying out the surplus of their grains in, co in coquetry, so that the shop front stood al along the thoroughfare with an air of invitation, like rows of smiling saleswomen. Even on a Sunday, when it veiled its more florid charms and lay comparatively empty of passage, the street shone out in contrast to its dingy neighbourhood, like a fire in a forest, and with its freshly painted shutters, well unpolished brasses, and general cleanliness and gaiety of note, instantly caught and pleased the eye of the passenger. So it's just basically saying there that as we're walking down this street, it's usually quiet, but the street they're walking down is really highly sought after. It's a really popular street. Two doors from one corner, on the left hand going east, the line was broken by the entry of a court, and just at that point a certain sinister block of building thrust forward in its gable on the street. It was two storeys high, showed no window, nothing but a door on the lower storey, sorry, storey, and a blind forehead of discoloured wall on the upper, and bore in every feature the marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. So the word sordid is an interesting word choice. Sordid suggests that things which aren't proper, things like alcoholism, um, prostitution, things like that, you might talk about being sordid. And it's an idea that it's been, this building's just been completely left alone. It's been left just to get worse and worse. And it's like, I, I'll analyse that word choice of uh, sinister as well. And uh, this setting is just going on to say that this uh, bit of setting is very important and it really gives us a clear picture of what Utterson and Enfield are seeing. Uh, it was two stories I showed no window, nothing but a door on the lower story and a blind forehead of discoloured wall on the upper and bore in every feature the marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. The door, which was equipped with neither bell nor knocker, was blistered and disdained. So think about what that suggests. Tramp slouched into the recess and struck matches on the panels. Children kept shop upon the steps. The schoolboy had tried his knife on the mouldings, and for close on a generation, no one had appeared to drive away these random visitors or to repair their ravages. It's really important there just to be thinking what exactly it is that the writer is telling us, what the narrator is telling us. Think about the environment this building seems to be and the state of the door and what it looks like and also the people who seem to be around and it will tell you exactly, it gives you a real idea as to the, the atmosphere that is being created. It's a slightly dangerous atmosphere that's being created. Mr Enfield and the lawyer were on the other side of the by street but when they came abreast of the entry the former lifted up his cane and pointed. Did you ever remark that door? he asked and when his companion had re replied in the affirmative it is consecuted in my mind added he with a very odd story. Indeed said Mr Utterson with a slight change of voice and what was that? Well it was this way returned Mr Enfield I was coming home from some place at the end of the world, about three o'clock of a black winter morning, and my way lay through a part of time, town where there was literally nothing to be seen but lamps. Street after street and all the folks asleep. Street after street, all lighted up as if for a procession and all as empty as a church, till at last I got into that state of mind when a man listens and listens 
and begins to and begins to and begins to long for the sight of a policeman. So obviously it's very long, it's very dark. There's nothing but the lamps, very quiet, and this makes Enfield feel uncomfortable. All at once. I saw two figures, one a little man who was stumping along eastward at a good walk and the other a girl of maybe eight or ten who was running as hard as she was able to cross to, to down a cross street. Just think about, you know, why it is that Enfield's out at this time of night. That's important. What's he been doing? We know night time, late nights, uh, Victorian England. We know it's associated with ideas of drinking, prostitution and things like that. So what does that suggest to us about the character of Enfield, you need to think? It goes on to tell us that this, um, these two people, uh, a man who was stumping along eastward at a good walk, so a small man who was walking along in an uncomfortable fashion is, uh, at a good pace, and an 8 or 10 year old girl who was running really fast. He goes on to tell us, Well sir, the two ran into one another naturally enough at the corner, and then came the horrible part of the thing. For the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man, it was like some damned juggernaut. I gave a few hello, took to my heels, collared my gentleman and brought him back to where there was already quite a group among the screaming child. He was perfectly cool and made no resistance, but gave me one look so ugly that it brought out the sweat on me like running. So uh, this look that the, this person gave him made him feel really disgusting and horrible and made him feel as it made him physically sweat just like as if he'd been for a run. The people who had turned out were the girl's own family, and pretty soon the doctor for whom she had been sent put, uh, put in his appearance. Well, the child was not much the worse, more frightened according to the sawbones, the doctor, and there you might have supposed would be an end to it. But there was one curious circumstance. I had taken a loathing to my gentleman at first sight. So had the child's family, which was only natural. But the doctor's case was what struck me. He, had the usual, he was the usual cut and dry apothecary of no particular age and colour with a strong Edinburgh accent and about as emotional as a bagpipe. Well sir, he was like the rest of us. Every time he looked at my prisoner I saw that Sawbones turned sick and white with desire to kill him. Just be thinking, just going to stop there, just be thinking about what we've been told about this, this character. We're told this man comes running and all of a sudden he crashes into a little girl. We're told that he trampled calmly over the child's body. That is a horrific image. This short, strange guy was quite happy to bump into this girl and then actually cl climb over her body as she screams and run away quite calmly. The word choice of calmly is very interesting. How would you react if you ran into an 8 or 10 year old girl and actually stood in her body? Would you carry on stamping on it and run over her or would you stop and be shot? This is very, very strange and that word choice is very good to quote uh, because it uh, really gives us an essence of the character of Mr. High, of, the, of, this, of this person, sorry, almost ruined it, of this person that, uh, this juggernaut as it's called, that um, we have, <laughs> that we have uh, run into, so to speak. So it's really the words of trampled and calmly. The word trample, if you trample over something it means that you, do, you don't really take a lot of care about it. And that's really quite a shocking word choice, and it tells us a lot. It's a very effective word choice as well. So we got here that, and then it goes to tell us that, that um, Enfield had instantly seen the guy and hated him, didn't like him whatsoever. And then the family of the girl also did, but so did the doctor. And every time the doctor looked at him, he saw him turn sick and white with desire to kill him. That's really emotive. That's an incredibly emotive thing to say, especially the word kill. It goes on to tell us, I knew what was in his mind, just as he knew what was in mine. And killing, being out of the question, we did the next best. We told the man we could and would make such a scandal out of this as should make his name stink from one end to London to the other. If he had any friends or any credit, money, we undertook that he should lose them. And all the time, as we were pitching it in red hot, we were keeping the women off him as best we could, for they were as wild as harpies. I never saw a circle of such hateful faces, 
and there was the man in the middle with a kind of black sneering coolness, coolness. Frightened too, I could see that, but carrying an officer, really, like Satan. If you choose to make capital out of this accident, said he, I am naturally helpless. No gentleman but wishes to avoid a scene, he says. Name your figure. So he's basically, they've got this sneering, uh, horrible kind of person, we're told really like Satan he was carrying off this repulsiveness. But he says, you know, if you're going to cause a scene and you're trying to make money, well, all I can do is let you have that money. There's nothing else that I can do. Quite simply, because I don't want to, ha I, I want to avoid a scene. I don't want everybody to know about this. And I certainly don't want my name to become bad. And he says, name your figure, name how much you want me to pay. Well, we screwed him up to a hundred pounds for the child's family. It's a lot of money in those times. He would have clearly liked to stick out, but there was something about the lot of us that meant mischief, and at last he struck. The next thing was to get the money, and where do you think he carried us? But to that place with the door, the strange door that they bumped into and were, and were discussing. Whipped out a key, went in, and presently came back with a matter of ten pounds in gold and a cheque for the balance of coots, drawn payable to the bearer and signed with a name that I can't mention, though it's one of the points of my story, but it was a name at least very well known and often printed. The figure was stiff, but the signature was good for more than that if it was only genuine. I took the liberty of pointing out to my gentleman that the whole business looked apocryphal and that a man does not, in real life, walk into a cellar door at four in the morning and come out with another man's cheque for close upon a hundred pounds. But he was quite easy and sneering. Set your mind at rest, says he. I will stay with you till the bank's open and cash the cheque myself. So we all set off, the, the, the doctor and the child's father and our friend and myself and passed the rest of the night in my chambers. And next day, when we had breakfasted, went into a body to the bank. I gave him the cheque myself and I said I had every reason to believe it was a forgery. Not a bit of it. The cheque was genuine. So it's just going here, it's telling us that the wee guy, this wee guy, horrible creature that everyone instantly hates and wants to kill. He's gone into the into this strange place with the door that they were talking about before. He's gone and he's come back with ten pounds in gold and a cheque for the remaining ninety pounds. And it's been signed by a man who does not want us to know exactly who it is at this moment. The Enfield himself doesn't want us to know who this man is. And he will reveal this in time, obviously, to the readers. So structurally, it's building up suspense. It's building up questions in our mind. We want to know what's happening. So we go on. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson. I see you feel as I do, said Mr. Renfield. Yes, it's a bad story. For my man was a fellow that nobody could have to do with. A really damnable man. And the person that drew the cheque is the very pink of the properties. Celebrated too. And... What makes it worse? One of your fellows who do what they call good. So basically he's saying that the man who signed this cheque is a good man, he's well known, Utterson knows him as well, and he, yeah, he's a good man. Goes on to tell us, blackmail I suppose, an honest man paying through the nose for some of the capers of his youth. Blackmail house is what I call that place with the door in consequence, though even that you know is far from explaining all he added. And with, uh, with the words fell a vein of musing. So what he's doing here is he's really saying that he believes, he's not convinced about this story, and he believes that a nice man that would sign for this cheque is probably being blackmailed for something. He's probably being blackmailed uh, because he's done something stupid when he was younger. This little man who trampled the girl knows about it, and he's blackmailing him. To blackmail somebody is to say, if you don't give me money, I will tell everybody about what you have done. And that's what Enfield expects uh, is the reason behind the, the man signing this cheque. From this he was recalled by Mr Utterson asking rather suddenly, and you don't know if the drawer of the cheque lives there? The drawer is the person who, who wrote it, who signed for it. A likely place, isn't it? returned Mr Enfield. But I happen to have noticed his address. He lives in some square or other. So the person who wrote the cheque uh, apparently lives in a different house, somewhere else. And you never asked about the, the place with the door, said Mr Utterson. 
No, sir. I had a delicacy, was the reply. I feel very strongly about putting questions. It partakes too much of the style of the Day of Judgment. You start a question and then it's like starting a stone. You sit quietly on the top of a hill and away the stone goes, starting others. And presently, some bland old bird, the last you would have thought of, is knocked on the head in its own back garden and the family have to change their name. No, sir, I make it a rule of mine. The more it looks like Queer Street, the less I ask. So he's basically saying, you know, I know when things are strange and the more stranger that things look, I just tend to not ask about it. I don't want to know. A very good rule too, said the lawyer. But I have studied the place for myself, continued Mr. Enfield. It seems scarcely a house. There is no other door and nobody goes in or out of that one but in a great while, the gentleman of my adventure. So he's really saying there that nobody, you know, that this, this house, there hardly seems to be anybody ever there. Nobody ever comes in or out. There's no other back door uh, apart from this little man that he saw trample the girl very occasionally. There are three windows looking on the court from the first floor, none below. The windows are always shut, but they're clean. And then there's a chimney which is generally smoking, so somebody must live there. And yet, it's not so sure, for the buildings are pa so packed together about the court that it's hard to say where one ends and another begins. So again, an important use of setting here. The pair walked on again for a while in silence, and then, Enfield, said Mr. Utterson, that's a good rule of yours. Yes, I think it is, returned Enfield. But for all that, continued the lawyer, there's one point I want to ask. I want to ask the name of that man who walked over the child. Well, said Mr. Enfield, I can't see what harm it will do. It was a name, a man of the name of Hyde. Again, a really interesting choice of name, the name Hyde. Obviously, it sounds like the word Hyde, the verb to hide. Hmm, said Mr. Utterson, what sort of a man is he to see? He is not easy to describe. There is something wrong with his appearance, something displeasing, something downright detestable. I never saw a man I so disliked, and yet I scarce know why. He must be deformed somewhere. He gives a strong feeling of deformity, although I couldn't specify the point. He's an extraordinary looking man, and yet I really can name nothing out of the way. No, sir, I can make no hand of it. I can't describe him. And it's not for want of memory, for I declare I can see him this moment. Yet it's strange, it's really peculiar and strange about this man, and Utterson, although he can picture him perfectly in his head, there's something about it. He just he can't describe it verbally. Very strange. Mr. Utterson walked, again walked some way in silence and obviously under a weight of consideration. You are sure he used a key, he inquired at last. My dear sir, began Enfield, surprised out of himself. Yes, I know, said Utterson. I know it must seem strange. The fact is, if I do not ask you the name of the other party, it is because I know it already. You see, Richard, your tale has, has gone home. If you have been, in, have been inexact in any point, you had better correct it. So he's saying that he's worked out the name of the rich man and he really wants to make sure that Enfield's got exactly this right story. Again, that really reflects how he's a lawyer. He's analysing this as a lawyer would, looking at the facts and making up his own opinion. I think you might have warned me, returned the other with a touch of sullenness. But I have been pa uh, pedantic, uh, pedantically exact, as you call it. But the fellow had a key, and that, and what's more, he has it still. I saw him use it not a week ago. Mr. Utterson sighed deeply, but never said a word, and the young man presently resumed. Here is another lesson to say nothing, he said he. I am ashamed of my long tongue. Let us bargain never to refer to this again. With all my heart, said the lawyer. I shake hands on it, Richard. That, that there takes the end of chapter one. Make sure that you've got good notes on it. Make sure that anything that I've raised, any points that you've seen highlighted, you've noted down into your general notes. Be using colour as well to organise your notes. If you look underneath this video in the description, what I've done is I've explained to you what the different highlighted colours refer to, what they mean. So make sure that you have a look at them and link it up with what the different uh, quotes that I've highlighted. Some of it will be explanations, some of it will be questions for you to think about, others, other parts of it will be analysis. 
as I say, take a look at the colours uh, that and what they represent underneath this video here.